We have a full 12 week immersive program. We also have a 20 week night and weekend program so people can earn while they learn here in San Francisco at our SOMA location, where smart, capable grownups who want to transition from non tech roles into tech but don't want to, aren't techie, can learn and move on. We've got amazing people that come out of banking, that come out of real estate, that come out of law, finance, management consulting, retail. Some of them have sales experience or marketing experience or design experience. Many do not. That's okay. Their life experience isn't as important as understanding what the knowledge, skills, and behaviors are necessary to make an impact in an early stage company. So it's been very successful. Now we've built a community, an army, if you will, of market developers that can help each other and help companies that we invest in grow and then just generally go out to the world and evangelize about this is how you find out whether or not there's a place for your product in a market and share that with the world so that we can reduce that failure rate from 90% for all startups and 70% for funded startups down, hopefully, quite significantly. Hey y'all, welcome to Selling with Social, the podcast that helps marketers increase marketing qualified leads, sales reps to shatter sales results, and sales leaders to grow as leaders. Each show, we interview sales, marketing, and social media practitioners, leaders, and influencers to help you connect, close more deals, build stronger relationships with clients, and improve your sales productivity. I'm Mario Martinez Jr. You're now listening to Selling with Social. Sean Shepard, I am so excited. Thank you very much, my friend, for joining me on Selling with Social today. This is going to be a great, fantastic hour, and I'm very excited to have you because what you're doing with entrepreneurs and those that the startup companies in teaching them sales and marketing skill set is absolutely necessary and needed in the industry. And I am so excited to have this discussion with you today. So thanks for joining me, my friend. Thanks for having me, Mario. It's a pleasure to finally get to spend some time with you. Fantastic. So a little bit about yourself. You are the founding partner of GrowthX. You also have spent a lot of time with VC funding, working with entrepreneurs. You have also are one of the founding trainers, if I'm not mistaken, on the GrowthX Academy, HuffPo contributor, Huffington Post, for those of you that are listening in. Is there anything that you don't do? I don't probably go to church as much as I should. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Well, <laughs> you now made your confession. Yeah. Good man. So, Sean, do me a favor. I obviously introduced you a little bit about your background. Tell our listeners we've got sales, we've got marketers, we've got entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, sales enablement folks from around the world listening in on this episode. Tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your background. Yeah, sure. I'm a five-time founder, always the sales guy in every company I've started. I have sold three companies and I've had a couple of very valuable and expensive learning experiences along the way as well. And a few years ago, I combined my passion for professional selling and entrepreneurship and education with a few other folks that are also investors and founders. And we saw an opportunity to help support entrepreneurship and innovation by building the GrowthX ecosystem, which is a family of companies that includes the GrowthX Venture Capital Fund, the GrowthX Accelerator, and the GrowthX Academy. And the whole thesis is simply around the idea that in today's marketplace, Mario, it's easier to start a company than it is to grow one. And it's easier to build a product than it is to sell it. So we wanted to invest in great product founders who didn't understand how market development worked. We wanted to help accelerate their growth with an accelerator that was focused on developing markets and raising revenue, as opposed to most of them that are developed, all of them, I believe, are focused on developing product and raising money. And then in addition to that, we launched an academy to develop the, the smart, talented people that want to work alongside them in fields of sales, marketing, and, and design, the areas that most greatly impact the growth of a company as opposed to the initial launch of that company. And then in addition to that, we've added uh, our GrowthX corporate innovation team, which is now working with big companies that are trying to learn how to work in the startup ecosystem as a way to maintain and create a competitive advantage going forward. No one wants to be the next yellow cab in a world of Ubers. <laughs> so what we found is, is the best way to support entrepreneurship and innovation was to build a support structure 
and infrastructure, an, an ecosystem, if you will, to support the founding, the funding, and the growing of those companies. And in particular, with my background in professional selling and my desire to elevate the profession to where I believe it should be, as opposed to where the, the negative stereotypes of society have placed it for so long, the academy has been a very important thing for me to uh, help stand up because I believe that sales is the greatest profession in the world. 50% of college graduates end up in sales-related roles with no background experience or education. Companies bear the brunt of that training. Turnover remains endemically high. There's a general misunderstanding about the value of sales and the intention of those in it. The retail sales experience has soiled it for a lot of people. But if you're truly great at what we do, you have the highest average earned income of any white collar role. You have the lowest divorce rate. You have the highest happiness quotient. And nobody in commerce does anything until somebody sells something. So I want to elevate the value and the role of, of selling in the marketplace. Uh, interesting background that you've got there, uh, especially with the fact that you actually sat in the seat of an entrepreneur in a startup organization and actually had success behind your ventures. And you know, you gave an interesting stat, 50% of college graduates, you're saying, yeah. end up in sales-related jobs after a four-year degree program? That's right. And all these folks that go to liberal arts colleges, they go look for a job. They don't see any posting saying seeking liberal artists. Uh, <laughs> Very true. There are, there are real jobs out there for these folks. And that comes from a Harvard study. Just don't take my word for it. Traditional education doesn't train us for this. And again, this goes back to from the industrial revolution. You go back to the way that education is structured in this country. Our education system was designed and built in Chicago in the, in the 19th century as a way to educate the children of farmers coming out of rural areas into big cities to work in factories. That's why there are school bells. It's just like a factory whistle. That's why the, the student desks are lined up in a very factory way. And it hasn't been updated. And in today's market, we need more than what colleges provide, unfortunately. Every year, the studies and the, the, the surveys are done around college preparedness for the workforce. And colleges all say, nine in 10 college provosts will tell you that their people are prepared for the workforce. And this is in non-STEM roles. And the, st the S in STEM should stand for sales, by the way. That's just my opinion. There is a science to selling but they don't have any background or any experience or any preparedness for the workplace. Because when you ask the employers, are these same college graduates prepared for you to go to work for you? 90% of those employers say no. So there's a big gap that exists in the market. And you know, as well as I do, as having hired those folks, having been those folks, having trained those folks, that if they just have the right context, knowledge, skills, and behaviors necessary to be successful, if we can accelerate this process. We can, we can have these people making an impact very quickly in companies of all shapes and sizes. Totally agree with you. It's interesting. You think about the different types of bachelor programs that are available out there. There's bachelor programs for marketing, for business management, for other related skill sets, but not for sales. And arguably, like if that stat, 50%, my gosh, like why yeah. don't we have business programs surrounding sales? Uh, I'm good friends with Howard Dover and Robert Peterson from two different universities, the Illinois University and University of Dallas, Texas, respectfully. And they have two programs that are designed to help put a bachelor's program in place for salespeople. But, but as far as I understand, there's only 42 universities, 42 universities around the country that actually have a sales certification. And there's a subset in that 42 that actually have a bachelor's program. Isn't yeah, that's crazy? right. It's called, it's, yeah, it is. It's the, that's the University Sales Alliance. And I applaud them for doing what they're doing. And I've been watching them from afar and trying to support them in my own way for the last 15 years. Because one of the things I've also noticed is some of the best salespeople I've ever met and best entrepreneurs are not college graduates. Right, absolutely. Um, because what it takes to be successful as an innovator and entrepreneur is rarely taught in school. And those of us that have the gumption to do what needs to be done, well, we're usually you know, thrown in a corner with, with a dunce cap in school and called uh, uh, malcontents or uh, hyperactive or ADD <laughs> or whatever the hell. I mean, they didn't have a name for this stuff when I was in school. I was just a, I was just a pain in everybody's ass. <laughs> um, 
So, you know, all of those things are great. The University Sales Alliance is doing good work and I've looked deeply into their curriculum and I'm not being critical, but it's not, uh, it's not modern. It's not anywhere near where it needs to be in today's marketplace, which is a whole other conversation about the fact that the market has never had more access to information before they ever engage another human about yeah. what they want to buy, how they want to buy, where they want to buy it, and how they make decisions. And as sales professionals, we have not done our job to stay up with that level of expectation that the market now has. And frankly, we're, we're kind of lazy when it comes to this, these things. So, so we're still applying old methods and tips and tricks and tactics where the market is not responding as well, especially in advanced technology where I, I tend to play most often. You're dealing with large enterprise sales, you're changing behaviors, you're taking manual processes and you're automating them, or you're trying to improve an existing automated process. You're dealing with a lot of different decision makers and navigating those waters and doing it in an intelligent way and reaching out to the right people at the right time with the right message so you can have the right conversation and be efficient about it and actually enjoy it while you're doing it is the challenge. And it's not rocket surgery, but it does require a little bit of effort to get there it, as a social seller. And I support what you're doing because without you know, social media is the new digital channel and it's everything. It creates an opportunity for sales professionals to learn before they contact, before they reach out. It yeah. gives them an opportunity, if they so choose to take it, to do the research, to find out who they should be talking to, about what, in what way, at what time, and hypothesize value in the, in the process, and then determine whether or not there's a fit to have a continued conversation or interaction. It shouldn't be spray and pray. It shouldn't right. be cold calling in the traditional sense. I understand why cold calling needed to happen. You didn't know who was on the other side of that line. You didn't know what they cared about. You didn't know what they were using. You didn't have to time know what their title was or role or function. You just had a basic bit of information and you were calling cold to try and find out where and who you should be talking to about what. Right. Well, today, you don't need to do that. You can warm up that call. And again, cold calling is one of the tombstones in my sales graveyard, as I say. If you do the work, if you take the time and put the effort in up front, you can have more pointed, relevant conversations with fewer people with more results. And that's where most people fall down. They kind of just follow the hurt. I 100% I, uh, agree with you. I think there's uh, areas where you may end up having to place a cold email or a cold call where there's no information that's available. But even then, you can glean information from company news, company information, industry information, right. industry happenings, competitors mm -hmm. that, are, that are moving things in the marketplace and be able to create somewhat of a lukewarm extended outreach to a cold prospect. And I think that's fundamentally some of the things that have changed inside of the sales dynamics, if you would. And one of the challenge areas that a lot of our peers, quite frankly, the 40 years and older who are sitting in the executive positions as director and above, we've grown up mm -hmm. doing sales the way we've always done it. And that acts actually breed a success. But what we didn't grow up with when we were cutting our teeth and earning our stripes, what we didn't grow up with was social media. What we didn't grow up with was texting as a channel for communication. What we didn't grow up with was a digital Rolodex as opposed to the old school Rolodex sitting on yeah. your desk. So lots of stuff has changed. But, you know, it's interesting. I want to I come back to something you said earlier, and that was talking about that many successful companies or entrepreneurs actually had, don't have a college degree. Yeah. I've seen some really interesting things that have come, come forth from that. Tell me for a second, we're talking about entrepreneurs what is the mindset of an entrepreneur? What are you looking for? There's grit. There's also skill set. There's a certain mindset that they have to have. If I have this great idea, what should I do? What should I be thinking about whether or not I should go and take the plunge? Like, Walk me through this personality, if you would, of an entrepreneur. We can talk tactically in a minute about next steps and what people should do if they decide they have an idea and they want to act on it. But really what we're talking about more than anything else are the attributes of the humans. You know, entrepreneurs are people that see what's possible, not what's impossible. They don't see the roadblocks in front of them as roadblocks. They see them as speed bumps. They see the future state in their mind. They completely can play it out. They have that vision and the clarity of that. They have just enough arrogance and just enough ignorance to believe that they're the right one to get done what needs to get done. They don't follow the herd. They have an amazing amount of grit and determination and stick-to-itiveness. 
No, they don't all have a growth mindset, unfortunately. What makes them great as innovators and entrepreneurs can make them not so great at learning and growing once they actually start talking to customers. People have a great vision for a product and they absolutely ardently believe in it and and their, their confidence in that is unwaverable, which is great and unshakable, but it doesn't mean you need to be stubborn about it. The idea is, uh, to me, the best and most balanced entrepreneurs. And this is something you'll see throughout history. Some of the greatest entrepreneurs are shit at running companies. There are very few Bill Gates and Michael Dells in the world and Andy Groves. There are very few of these people who start something that can grow it and then continually manage it. And it's because, typically, that there's a difference between the inventor and the innovator. As Jean B. Baptiste say, who came up with the term entrepreneurship, a great French thinker, that, that makes them very different. The inventor mindset is very different than the innovator mindset. The inventor is the one that can create the idea, and then the innovator is the one that can apply that idea in the marketplace in a valuable way. And we try to take inventors and turn them into innovators. And when we can, great. If we can't, then we don't work with them because that's the difference between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. Can you handle feedback? You know, something we talk about around here is we replace the word rejection with feedback. Feedback is a gift. Everything that you create and do, every message that you write, everything that you communicate should be designed to do one thing, and that that is to get feedback from the market. And look for the truth, whatever that truth is. You may not like what you find, but the goal, nonetheless, is to get to the truth as quickly and efficiently as possible. So those are kind of some of the key character traits of entrepreneurs, I think. They have an amazing work ethic. They have an ardent belief in themselves and their vision. They're also slightly tortured with a lot of insecurity about and fear about whether or not they're ever going to get it right. Failure does bother them to a certain degree. But there's also, in the growth mindset, you know, there's only failure if you don't learn from it. And I think some of the most successful entrepreneurs are learned entrepreneurs. They've been folks that that have tried and tried and tried and tried and tried again. And as you know, using sports metaphors, if you're right three out of 10 times at the plate in the baseball game over a lifetime, you're in the Hall of Fame. Michael Jordan will tell you he's missed a hell of a lot more shots than he ever made at the game-winning time. You watch now the Steph Currys of the world, who will go on a run of 0 for 8 or 0 for 9 or 0 for 10. I remember last year in a playoff game right about this time against Portland, he went 0 for 11 all the way until the fourth quarter. He got hot, and then he set a record in the, in the overtime for most points scored in an overtime. Yeah. Most guys had thrown up 18 shots and made one or two, would have put their tail between their legs and gone back to the bench and not gotten up again. That's what great entrepreneurs do. It's not how they act, but it's how they react in adverse situations that define them. Really great definition and description of an entrepreneur. And, and as you know, uh, we brand... Oh, there's also one other term for entrepreneur. It, it, it's French for, for crazy person. How's that? Uh, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> My wife thinks I'm crazy. But as you know, we, we branched out. That this is We're now a year and four months or two months in, in the making. And I spent 18 years in corporate, right? Right. And it, it all came to... I would have slipped my throat about 18 months in, but that's just my <laughs> mindset. I had a- <laughs> That's another trait of an entrepreneur. <laughs> we, we don't like to be told what to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was definitely one of my, my uh, performance improvement uh, uh, my issues that I always had. I always had. I have some great stories of some of my most senior leaders who are very good friends and mentors of mine that they're just like, <laughs> you can't do those types of things, even if it makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it, it was interesting because I grew up in corporate and I broke. Uh, there was no doubt about it. If you ask any of the leaders that I worked for, especially early on in my first 10 years in corporate, I broke so much glass. I was the bull in the China shop. They labeled me breaking glass all the time. That was in my performance report, bull in the China shop, you know, trying to make things happen, even though it made sense, but you couldn't get consensus. And there yep. didn't get consensus that the other person was dumb and you can't call them dumb. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of those things. So, so inside of me, apparently, I was this, this entrepreneur just like trying to figure out how to move things forward inside of a corporate world. And, and that's what actually a lot of my leaders really loved about me was I could see yeah. things and I could see what's possible, not what was impossible. And well, like, you brought up the, uh, the Breakable, right? What was that movie last year, two years ago, Unbreakable, about Ernie Zampezi or the Olympic uh, runner that right. went through that horrible experience in the South Pacific in World War II? 
Yep. And I and my grandfather was served in that war as well. And I'm sure many listening to this will been the same thing. He said, if you can take it, you can make it. Yep. So 18 months into your life as an entrepreneur, it's it's there's a lot to it, right? It's not just the right. role of an individual contributor is sitting in one of those cubicles behind you with uh, with all the support. With all the clarity of role and purpose, with management, leadership, and, and everything that you need to do your job with a history and a track record of the company and the market, the product, and all of those things. When you're an entrepreneur, you don't have any of that. You have a whiteboard. Yep. You know, that's all it is. Now you've got to go and create. What are you going to do with it? Right? And how are you going to do it? And that's where, that's where the challenge is. And then setting and managing expectations. This stuff takes twice as long, costs twice as much, and imparts twice as much heartache as you can ever imagine on an individual and their family and their support system and the people around them. And, and if you can just work your way through those times, if you can just figure out a way to stay on the field for as long as possible, your chances of success greatly increase. The companies we invest in, the at, between the seed stage, when they first get that round of money, anywhere between 300, 250000 to say a million dollars, between then and when they actually get to break even or they're able to raise another round of money, seven in 10 of those companies fail. 70% of them. And these are companies that have actually raised money, right? 90% of startups fail. So and why do they fail? Well, I'm glad, glad you asked, Sean. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they typically fail because of, well, the actual data, according to CB Insights, is eight of the top 10 reasons have nothing to do with their product. They have to do with market and people. So you either don't know how to sell what you're selling, you're not selling to the right marketplace, you have a lack of differentiation, the people don't get along with each other and they'll kill it quickly. Because it's not the software that wins in the software business, it's the hardware, it's the people. We invest in great people, we'll continue to keep investing in those great people. That's not any different than if you find a great high potential employee in your organization when you're working in corporate America, sure. and you're going to do whatever you can to keep them and continue to grow them and develop them because they're going to continue to deliver value, right? right? Same kind of thing. So they have to do with people and markets. They have nothing to do with product. And that's what people often overlook. And great product founders are ardent in their belief about, I've got this great idea, and if everybody just understood it, then everything would be great, or they don't get it. <laughs> got an entrepreneur who just walked into the room and just gave me the thumbs up because he knows exactly what I'm talking about. But these are the kinds of things that people need to recognize and that they, they don't. And a lot of it just has to do with your own intestinal fortitude and your ability to accept that feedback and learn. You know, Take that attitude of, here, I made this. What do you think? Yeah. Will this be valuable to you in this form? Probably not. 90% yeah. of what you take to market is wrong. The goal is to just stay in business long enough to where tomorrow it can be 89%. And the day after that can be 88 and 87 and so on to where you start to get to a tipping point where the product starts to deliver more value than it doesn't. And you start to be more of a producer than a consumer of information and value. And that's where it's, that's where it's key. Totally agree with you on that. I loved what you said. Also, we as entrepreneurs have a fix, the, the difference between the fixed mindset and the growth mindset. Yeah. And, and if, I, if I think about that description that you gave just a second ago, and you apply that to actually sales, salespeople, marketers, whether you're in corporate or you're an entrepreneur, like that type of thinking, growth mindset, in my opinion, oftentimes is lacking in corporate world at various different elements in the leadership ranks. And there's a fixed mindset. Just think about, I think I heard it was, it was it Coca-Cola? Their CMO uh, was recently nixed from Coke. And well, it wasn't for running a Pepsi commercial, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. So, but just thinking about this whole concept, whether you know, you're a CMO of a massive organization and the way that you did business and the way that you did things was just the way you did them. And this is what proved out to get you here is not necessarily what's going to get you there. And it reminds me of, that, of a book by Marshall Goldsmith. I've said, I've talked about this before on the show on Selling with Social. Marshall Goldsmith published a book and it was called What Got You Here Won't Get You There. And right. it was all on the concept of person who's been in an, an individual contributor role moving into a leadership role and having changing that mindset. But if you think about this, whether you're an entrepreneur, you're a salesperson, you're a marketer, whatever the case might be, in order for you to advance internally but more importantly, to advance the prospect or the buyer it, as a customer into your actual service portfolio, you've got to have that growth mindset in terms of trying new things that the market is demanding of you in order to be able to be successful. 
Yeah, you're right. And when you say, you know, what got you that management job was not that you were a great manager. In fact, I've seen both sides of this. I was just moderating a panel with David Delaney and Ralph Barcy and Matt Amundsen and Kat Andruha on sales development management and leadership. And some of the best managers I've seen were not great individual contributors in sales roles. Yeah. Some of the worst managers I've seen were rock stars in those individual control. And I'll use, uh, I'll use another sports analogy. Larry Bird and Magic Johnson did not do well, and Michael Jordan did not do well as coaches, right? They did great as individual contributors because they don't understand the difference. And you do have to continue to develop yourself in any of these roles. At the academy, at GrowthX Academy, we always talk about the fact that there's no distinction between personal and professional development in human-centered roles. If you develop the person, you're going to develop as the professional. And you're going to continue to drive and deliver value. So you're right. There's a big difference between being that individual contributor and being a manager and then ultimately being a leader. And it starts with recognizing and defining what success is, Mario. So as an individual contributor, success generally, to me, success is all about helping others be successful. And if I can help others be successful, then I will be more successful. And then if I can do that at scale that creates that much more scalable value in the market. And at at GrowthX, we're trying to do that by helping founders, helping funders, helping people who want to work with them that help others out there beyond that. And now that you mentioned that, I want to actually drill down a little bit on the GrowthX Academy. I know that I'm going to be helping out as a mentor. And yeah, I'm super and we're happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I'm a super excited about this. I, I have a, a strong passion and love to help entrepreneurs through that process. I, I am 14 months into this, and it has been the hardest, single-handedly, single-handedly, the hardest thing I've ever done in my 19 completed years of corporate history, right? Yeah. I've worked more hours than I ever have before. I went from <laughs> I went from being the VP who had sales operations, the admin, the sales team, marketing team to being a soloist and now, you know, seven man and we've got massive expansion programs that are coming forth. And so, as I think about this, I'm like, man, it has been hard. And so there's a special love that I have to want to help other people. So walk me through Growth X Academy. You talked about its mission earlier. What is it all about and how can you help entrepreneurs and solopreneurs excel and win? Yeah, we saw this big problem myself and my partners who were all uh, successful entrepreneurs and sellers and marketers that the majority of the great product founders that we encountered and tried to help and invest in didn't have a clue on how to develop markets. And in today's economy, where it's easier to start a company than it is to grow one, and I'll give you a good example. The first time I was involved in raising money for a company, we raised eight and a half million bucks to just to get an MVP to market. I could, that was 16, 17, 18 years ago now. I could build that same product today for about $200,000. Wow. All the infrastructure exists that yeah. didn't exist before. And we're talking primarily around mostly applied technologies, although the, the rules are the same. So what used to be the commodity was the sales and marketing side of the house. Market development used to be the thing that was, that was commoditized. And everyone would deify product development as they were the great, you know, the great changers of, of, of the world. But today, coding is the new blue-collar role. I'm sorry to say it. But getting an MVP to market is not difficult. But getting people to pay for it is. And so in a noisy space with tons of products, how do you differentiate yourself? And so we saw that as our opportunity. And our thesis is simply that while products and markets are unique, the path to product market fit is not. And after doing this for 20 years across a wide variety of products and markets and verticals, I've developed a methodology based on pattern recognition to help any product in any market get to the truth as quickly and efficiently as possible. What you do with that truth doesn't matter. So whether it's Mario figuring out how to position social selling as a thing in the marketplace, as a new entrepreneur coming out of 18 years in the corporate world, or it's helping Mario as a corporate leader take a product of ideas inside of a company into the powers that be, aka the market, inside of that company and get to the truth there and figure out if there actually is a path for this idea to be turned into something and gain real traction in the process. And that's what our corporate innovation group does. 
So it doesn't matter if it's those things or it's an actual physical product in the market. It doesn't matter if it's business to consumer, business to business, marketplaces online or offline. Technology constantly changes, but human behavior doesn't, Mario. And until it does, this methodology doesn't need to change. And it works. As a result, we have an incredibly high success record with our startup portfolio, with our realized rate of return. And then ultimately, what we realized is in the course of investing in companies and growing them, we eventually had to step away from those companies because we would teach them to fish and fish alongside them until we didn't need to anymore. Right. And then we would have to find fishermen to replace ourselves. And the best way to do that was to develop the talent ourselves. Why? Because traditional education, institutional education, as I call it, because it'll make you crazy, doesn't provide the skill set to work in these roles. And it certainly doesn't teach you the behaviors necessary to work in an early stage company, which yeah. is very different than working in a big mature company, as you know. Yeah. It requires a different set of attributes and behaviors than working in a later stage company. Yeah. So we looked at it and said, all right, what are the roles that move the needle in market development for startups in our portfolio? And the ones that move the needle the most are sales and business development, marketing, digital marketing of any sort, and then UX and design. The things that change the way people use products, adopt products, learn from those products. And so those are the areas where we have a full 12 week immersive program. We also have a 20 week night and weekend program. So people can learn why they learn here in San Francisco at our SOMA location where smart, capable grownups who want to transition from non-tech roles into tech, but don't want to, aren't techy, can learn and move on. We've got amazing people that come out of banking, that come out of real estate, that come out of law, finance, management consulting, retail. Some of them have sales experience or marketing experience or design experience. Many do not. That's okay. Their life experience isn't as important as understanding what the knowledge, skills, and behaviors are necessary to make an impact in an early stage company. So it's been very successful. Now we've built a community, an army, if you will, of market developers that can help each other and help companies that we invest in grow and then just generally go out to the world and evangelize about this is how you find out whether or not there's a place for your product in a market and share that with the world so that we can reduce that failure rate from 90% for all startups and 70% for funded startups down, hopefully, quite significantly. So, Sean, are, are you physically taking people through business and marketing education program, things like understanding models, uh, startup methodologies? Uh, what about the sales funnel, sales process, entrepreneurial selling, and, you know, spin selling, yes. those types of things? Well, are you physically taking people through this education and awareness and teaching them what's important to apply when they need it? Yes. I'm like United Airlines. I'm physically dragging them down the aisle of education. <laughs> Oh, uh, right to, on the heels to, of United Airlines. To, uh, yeah. <laughs> to gate 28 of success and then into a holding tank. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so the four pillars of the Growth X Academy are mindset, mastery, career, and community. First, we get people into the right mindset that we were talking about earlier, out of a fixed mindset that they can't do everything, that information can be a criticism into, I'm capable of anything. As long as I, and I recognize that I have the capacity to improve in all areas of my life and that feedback is a gift and that I'm here to learn into mastery, which is you don't have to be born with talent. This idea that people are just born salespeople is bullshit. That's an easy, lazy answer to a question that you don't understand, right? So for this week, for example, I have to do this talk at the American Association of Inside Sales Professionals on the art and science of closing deals. And I'm going to do what I always do when the people, these people ask me this. Closing A is, is also, a, it's also a tombstone in my graveyard. There's no such thing as closing as a tactic or a trick. It's a byproduct of being fully immersed in helping others be successful. Sure. That's part of mindset, right? That's part of mastery, mastering human interaction. This idea that with deliberate practice and enough time, 10 years, 10,000 hours, whatever it takes, you can not just achieve knowledge and competency and proficiency, but true mastery in any aspect of your life or in your profession. And then there's career. None of this matters to these folks if they don't get a job they want, working in a company they enjoy, doing what they love. And companies are just collections of humans. And so we shift their mind around that. And we apply the sales and marketing funnels and tools, but metal, models and methodologies that we teach in the academy that are prevalent across all sales organizations to the career process. So as I talked about product market fit, there's also person company fit. So what's your ideal role profile? What's your ideal company profile? Where are those folks? How do you find them? How do you talk to them in a way that generates interest? 
How do you under, unco uncover whether or not they have needs? How do you do it by talking to decision makers and not recruiters? And how do you get multiple job offers from companies that you love? And you build a funnel and you execute against that. And career development is critical. And then finally, it's community. A community-based education approach where you have access to everyone at all times for everything. You're in the sales program, but you want to learn some growth marketing courses. You can walk right across the hall into a growth marketing class or leverage those folks. You want to understand how design impacts sales and the customer journey. You can talk to design. You get cross-functional programming. And we have this global network of awesome mentors like yourself who've been there, done that, got the t-shirt, that are referring great talent in, that want to transition into tech roles but don't know where to start and how, who can hire these folks, who can leverage them for student projects, who can contribute content to the community. And then from a curriculum standpoint, and the sales track in particular, we start with what I think are the, are the two most important skills for any sales professional, business and market acumen. Yeah. Understanding how businesses work, understanding who their customers are, how they talk to them, how they serve them and sell to them, how they make money, what their cost structures are, how the business is measured, how the individuals that they're selling into are measured and how their bosses are measured, how they're delivering value to their customers. Understanding how a business works is the only way to truly understand how to help it. And so we get them in a way of quickly being able to analyze in an accelerated fashion what a business does and how they can hypothesize value to that business. Then market acumen. Are you selling into a particular industry, market, or customer segment? If you're in cybersecurity, you, we teach you how to be the expert in cybersecurity without actually being a coder and becoming a true thought leader and subject matter expert in a field. Why is this important? Because you know as well as I do, Mario, the most successful sales organizations are thought leaders and partners to their customer base. And the only way to do that is to be just as good at what they do as they are and understand it just as well, if not better. So that's business and market acumen. We start with that. We get into lean methodologies. We get into business model canvassing. We get into personal mindset. They take personality profile tests. We get them focused on mindfulness and awareness so they understand who they are, what their natural abilities and strengths are, where the gap analysis is, and then we design an individual lesson plan for everyone's experience. Then we get into communications, which is the second most important thing behind business and market acumen. How do you communicate effectively, synchronously, asynchronously? over the phone, in person, verbal, nonverbal, all the tools and presentations to create credibility. Every first impression only has one opportunity to show itself as unique and different. How do you handle that? How do you get rid of stupid things like filler words and up-talking and the, the little things that people do to damage their own credibility in communicating? Then it's industry customers and buying behaviors. Who are customers? What's the psychology of them? How do they work? How do they operate? How do they respond to risk and change? What kind of buyer types are they? What roles and influences exist? So we take a very market-first approach to all of this. Then we get into all the sales models and methodologies that are most prevalent in the marketplace from spin selling from Dr. Rackham and major account strategies. Why? They're rooted in data. And we know they're all rooted in human behavior. And they teach you how people buy. They teach you how to align your selling to that. They teach you how to uncover needs. Then we get into the predictable revenue model, which is the modern way of identifying and generating warm leads as opposed to cold ones. Then we get into the new strategic selling and understanding how to manage and navigate account-based management, account-based selling. And then challenger sales as a way of understanding how to control conversation, create leadership, and move your way through that. And there's a whole ton of other resources in there. Then we get into sales process and techniques, the actual functional aspects of everything is a funnel. How do you build a funnel? How do you define the stages in that funnel? How do you specialize roles within that funnel? How do you manage pipelines? How do you build lead gen programs? And then sales operations and enablement. How do you support the functions? How do you use all the systems, tools, and technology to do it? And then management and leadership and the difference between those. And then, oh, by the way, at the core of all of it is the GrowthX Market Acceleration Program. Everyone that goes through our program understands how we accelerate companies, how to find product market fit for any new product in any new market at any time. And if they can do that, now they can go to the market and be effective, whether it's in an early stage company or a later stage company. So companies that are listening in, leaders that are listening in from various different high growth startup companies, can they tap into the talent that you are training for yes. job placement type of uh, opportunities or to be able to recruit people from, from the GrowthX Academy? 
Yeah, as part of the competency-based community education model, we, the, the students work on real projects with real companies for at least 50 to 75% of their time here. So companies can come in and partner for student projects. If they love that, they want continued effort, they can partner with GrowthX Studios, which is a place where graduate students go to work with senior leaders in the areas of design, sales, and marketing and actually get paid projects. Then they can also hire these folks afterwards as well. So everybody has an opportunity one way or another to leverage and take advantage of the community. Fantastic. What you've described is, I wish, man, 20 years ago, I wish I had the ability to uh, have gone through a program like this myself and have taught me some, some of the, the, the hard lessons that I had to learn as a young buck and in going into sales. This is absolutely fantastic, Sean. Listen, if somebody wants to get a hold of you or they want to connect with you, what's the best way for them to be able to reach out? Is it through LinkedIn, email, your website? What, what's the best way for someone to, to connect with you after listening to this podcast? Yeah, sure. If they're interested in connecting with me directly, they can find me on, hit me up on LinkedIn. Absolutely. They can follow me on Twitter at Sean A. Shepard. If they're interested in the academy as a student or as a potential project company, they can go directly to gxacademy.com, hit up hello at, at gxacademy.com. And by the way, a lot of companies are now sending their own uh, new hires, especially early stage companies through these programs, their first sales hire, the first marketing hire, the first design hire, and they're working on their projects while they're here. If they're entrepreneurs interested in investment, they can go through growthx.com and, and submit there. If we invest in a company, then they can apply for our accelerator program. And then we're always doing workshops and talks and various things around the globe. Our goal is to bring the GrowthX ecosystem to every large entrepreneurial market on the planet. We're about ready to announce some major partnerships with some other large markets where we're going to be bringing the academy and the accelerator and the fund into those areas. Fantastic. And I always like to close with just a couple of questions. We're obviously talking to sales and marketers and entrepreneurs here on this episode of Selling with Social. If you were to put together your top piece of advice, for any, anybody in sales or marketing, what would it be? Never fry bacon in the nude. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I love it. I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> Note to self. <laughs> yeah, very painful. No, my number one piece of advice for anyone in sales and marketing generally is to just never stop learning. Always seek out new and, and different ways of learning. And don't forget that at the end of the day, this is all about talking to humans. As many tools and technologies that exist in the marketplace, as many ways as there are to, to connect and interact, it's just with other people. My biggest fear is that technology has made us certainly more interconnected. It's made us less interpersonal. And I don't want people to lose the humanity in what we do and forget the purpose that I would like to think that, you know, the meaning of life is to give life meaning. And that comes from helping others. Yeah. And if you can, the work that you do can help others, then I think and, and the work you do for yourself and for your family and for your community is good, then uh, I think you can le lead a very meaningful life. Yeah, fantastic. And last and final question before we go, totally off subject, love to ask every one of my guests, your favorite all-time movie? Oh, man, it's, it's Caddyshack. It is just nothing. There's, it's Caddyshack is number one. I would say Gross Point Blank is probably number two. Put Animal House, Strange Brew, um, you know, and a lot of those, uh, the, the silly uh, slapstick movies slapstick. have always been my, they've always been my favorite. Oh, I love it. Uh, fantastic. Yeah. Well, yeah. Listen. <clears throat> Ron, I, Ron Burgundy's starting to climb the, climb the ladder, I think, over time. Yeah, yeah, Ron, he did that, that, that one. That, that, I just was talking about that on another episode with Ron and the Dumb and Dumber uh, slapstick comedy. Uh, I think right now, Airplane is very appropriate, wouldn't you say? <laughs> oh, poor United. <laughs> so much for this being evergreen content, Mario. You're going to have to cut those references out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> for those of you listening in one year from now, <laughs> yeah. look up United. What was the flight number? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> it was United Fight Number 93. <laughs> United Fight Number. 
bags, man, off the airplane. Yeah. <laughs> because they overbooked. <laughs> well, listen, Sean, you've been an awesome guest to have on Selling with Social. Excited to uh, have you on the show. I want to thank you very much. And for those of you that are listening in right now, we'll make sure we put in all the links to Growth X Academy, Sean's contact information into the show notes. So thanks for joining us. And Sean, fantastic having you. Thanks for having me, Mario. I'll talk to you soon. Take care, buddy. Thanks for listening to the Selling with Social podcast. I'm super pumped that you are our guest today. Here's what I want you to do right now. Go to M, the number three, jr.com forward slash podcast and support our podcast, please, by distributing it out anywhere you can get it to on social. And don't forget to subscribe to us on iTunes. You'll find all the instructions there on the site on how to subscribe to the Selling with Social podcast. Until the next show, keep on rocking. Mario Martinez Jr., out.